Yeah, you mentioned, I remember back in 2016 or yeah, leading up to the election, uh, um, it was just a given that Hillary Clinton would win. And so the just the idea of Trump winning was just, it was like almost impossible for people to conceive of. But obviously he did win. And the fact that people couldn't see the writing on the wall really speaks to the kind of echo chambers that we can be in politically, ideologically, with the information that we, we receive through the media. Um, it, it's um, So I think also this applies to the Roe v. Wade issue because I think for a long time, the way that I always viewed kind of the Republican approach to this was that the, uh, the Roe v. Wade issue, the issue around abortion, uh, reproductive rights, was that it was always an effective tool to fundraise. So as long as there was always this goal of like, we're going to overturn this this horrific thing, uh, please support us, vote for us, get us into office, and we'll make that happen. And I felt like the Democrats also played that same game where they're like, vote for us and we'll protect your right to, to have an abortion, to have reproductive rights. Um, so for me, it always was like they were never really going to go after it. It seemed almost like an impossible thing that would never, it just would never happen. Um, was there, do you think that that's fair in describing the Republicans approach or do you think there was some sort of shift that occurred in which they just decided, you know, we're actually going to take down this thing? So I think you're partially correct. I think up until mm. relatively recently and relatively, I mean, within the past decade, um, mm. yeah, the Republicans never considered what would happen if they turned into the, the dog that caught the car. Right. Um, you know, and I'd also point out that with, with Donald Trump, um, Donald Trump is a symptom. He's not the, the disease sure. as sure. Barack Obama points out. And I, I use that quote in, in literally is the first quote in my book. Mm -hmm. Um, he, but he represents the id of the Republican base, right? Mm -hmm. He is what the average Republican wants. He is represents the way the average Republican sees the universe sees the nation, sees our place, sees Christianity. And so he is kind of, he is everybody's drunk, handsy, asshole, racist uncle who shows up at Thanksgiving and makes everything uncomfortable. Yeah. But, you know, he is, he's kind, he's kind of, you know, uh, an avatar of id. So yeah. when it, but as far as Republicans catching the car, they uh, Republican leadership used to be like that. That is, yeah, they they probably took that sort of a cynical approach to it. Um, you know, uh, people like um, uh, John Boehner, good example, um, probably was one of the most cynical ones when it came to that sort of thing. Um, sure. But they they weeded out the the. Um, Tea Party weeded out anybody from re Republican leadership who wasn't a true believer, right? Um, if you look at what happened to Cantor and DeMint and Paul Ryan, they all got forced out, and Republican leadership has just gotten crazier and more radical as time goes by and more devoted to the leader, right? Mm -hmm. There's nobody, almost nobody left that will speak out against Trump. Right? right. No matter mm -hmm. how unhinged he is, no matter if he's proposing that we start a war with Mexico or, you know, going along with, you know, Candace Owens suggestion that we should invade Canada to liberate it from Justin Trudeau. It it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. The mm -hmm. the you know, uh, one of the quotes I use in my book is, you know, we've you know, from Game of Thrones, you know, we've had we've had vicious kings. We've had idiot kings, but I don't know that we've ever been cursed with a vicious idiot for a king. Mm. Um, so now. At this point, yeah, Republican leadership uh, is happy that this happened. They have delivered for the base because only their base matters, because the only elections for 90 plus percent of Republicans, the only that ma election that matters is the primaries, right? Mm -hmm. um, only about 8 percent of U.S. House seats are competitive. Um, and then for Republicans, they're cynical enough that they will turn right around and say, send us money so that, uh, the Supreme Court doesn't change and, and abortion remains illegal. Mm -hmm. And they will fundraise off of that or mm -hmm. they'll fundraise off of, um, 
banning same-sex marriage, which is still very unpopular with white evangelicals, or they will fundraise off of uh, going after trans people. But when it comes to abortion, I expect that they will um, fundraise off of we successfully killed Roe versus Wade, and we need money to make sure it stays dead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, and that sounds a lot like what Democrats are doing, but from the other end where they're asking people to please vote Democrat, uh, let's fundraise for this issue, let's keep... uh, Let's make sure that Roe v. Wade is protected. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the things that have been pointed out over the past while now is that they could have actually codified, uh, you know, abortion or reproductive rights as as a law, like as something that would be protected. And I think that's yes. something that's a bit, I guess, that that is revealing is that, you know, Roe v. Wade was a, a legal precedent, I suppose, instead of an actual law i i I, Mm -hmm. so so i guess the democrat yeah the democrats are just as cynical and just as uh willing to use this issue as a way to to raise funds and and Uh, campaign on democrats more than republicans i think were guilty of a lack of imagination that roe versus wade could fall i think Mm -hmm. that they always assumed it was going to be there and because let's face it abortion is is a tough thing to think about they wanted to steer the conversation away from that. And the t- last time that they really had the power to do it without the filibuster was in 2009, 2010. And they decided to spend all their political capital on getting the Affordable Care Act passed. Right mm-hmm. now we've had a two year interregnum where it would take repealing the repealing the fil- or ending the filibuster. And there's no appetite from cinema and mansion to do it. Um, because they still believe that the old or order holds true, that they, for whatever reason, can't see what's on rushing towards the United States, which is such deep fissures and animus that the U.S. is going to splinter. And I personally expect that there's going to be a at some point there will reach a breaking point and there will be a massive upsurge in violence, both organized, semi-organized. And completely stochastic. Mm. Mm-hmm. Before we started recording, you were uh, talking about this process you underwent during uh, the writing of your book, American Fascism. Uh, you described it as a form of therapy. And I think this is an important theme throughout my work because uh, while I do talk about subjects like we're alluding to, a, we're, we're talking about American fascism, we're talking about this upswelling of fascism. Um, I discuss this issue as, along with climate change um, and environmental issues. I, I cover several different subjects. And one of the things that cuts through all of that is the way in which denialism um, is present in many of the conversations that we're having around these subjects. Um, and I feel like this denialism has come up in different forms. I, I saw it leading up to Trump being elected. I saw it during his presidency. Um, I definitely saw it after Biden was elected. Uh, the denialism has come up in different forms. And uh, I would like if you could talk about this idea of, of denialism playing a big role in, uh, I guess, occluding our ability or occluding people's ability to, to see clearly what's occurring right now and preparing effectively for it. So, you know, I don't want to hold myself up as as some paragon, but I don't think that I was, I don't think that I was deeply in denial as most people about where this would go. And I think uh, most people are still in denial. Um, My challenge was working my way through anger and bargaining and depression to reach a point of acceptance where it's like, yeah, this is going to happen. All I can do is warn people and be ready to pull the ejection seat handle to head out to Canada with the family. Right. But Mm -hmm. as far as denial goes, I'm still receiving a ton of pushback about, well, oh, well, Alito absolutely said that you can't use this to do this. And I'm like, yeah, he lied to Congress about respecting stare decisis. You think he's after he's told people exactly how to overturn Obergefell and and basically beg for them to bring cases that he's going to let this one little thing. This this was basically his his decision was basically a nod to Paul Clements as well. We'll sort that out later. 
It wasn't saying we won't consider it. It can't be considered. It's just we could consider that later as a mm -hmm. separate issue, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that, and we know exactly how that's going to go. We, you know, but there's still people that are in denial that, well, Republicans wouldn't go that far. Um, oh, no, of course, Republicans wouldn't actually overturn an election. That would just cause too much friction. Oh, my God, they would never overturn Roe versus Wade. They might soften it a little bit, but that would that would be that would be too explosive. Um, oh, they would never overturn Obergefell. Uh, same sex marriage is way too popular. This is, this, you know, this, you know, 70 percent of, you know, over 70 percent of America supports it. They the court isn't that daft. They wouldn't, you know, go completely against the will of the American people. They um, right. You know, there's there's all kinds of reasons why people want to argue, uh, you know, oh, that could never happen. Oh, well, no, Republicans would drop short. Oh, no, the court would stop that. You know, and the thing that I always remember is Masha Gessen's Masha Gessen's essay from right after the election about surviving autocracy and the two most important rules from it in that in that uh, article that she wrote were, you know, believe the autocrat. Right. When Republicans say they're going to do a thing, they're going to do a thing. Right. And especially when they say something horrible and then walk it back, believe the first thing they said. Um, you know, there's the other quote is, you know, when somebody shows you who they are the first time, believe them. The other mm -hmm. one is rule for surviving autocracy that you never, never, never forget is your institutions will not save you. And mm -hmm. you need to understand that the U.S. Constitution, the Supreme Court, the, the respect for the office of president, uh, tradition, uh, norms of, of decorum, none of those things will hold back the GOP because yes, there are some GOP types that are very cynical that, that behind closed doors will tell you, yeah, of course, Trump is a blithering idiot and a madman and incompetent. They'll never say it in public. They exist to give their constituents Right. And when I say constituents, I mean the people who keep them elected in primaries, a.k.a. the religious right. They exist to give them the culture war results that they want. Mm. Right. The Republican Party isn't about international trade or um, tax cuts um, uh, other than, you know, or 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 policy other than to provide corporations the kinds of breaks uh, that they need, that they not need, but want. But primarily they exist as a function of providing outrage to people through the media arm and then addressing that outrage that they've created through bizarre draconian laws like Florida's don't say gay bill or uh, revoking Disney's uh, status as, as an incorporated town. Right. Mm -hmm. It was ill considered and stupid and reactionary, but they got the rubes fired up and then they made the rubes happy by doing something about it, even if what they did was stupid and ill considered. Mm -hmm. And given that the, that the, you know, they're, what are they forcing over a billion dollars in debt on f people in two Florida counties? Yeah. You know, Osceola and Orange, uh, Orange County, I believe. Um, they still don't care. It's still not enough to change it because partisanship has reached such a point where people no longer care about policy or how it affects them. It's, it's all about, are we sticking it to the other side? And this is, I'm far more so with Republicans and Democrats. There's some recent polling data that came out that showed that Democrats value compromise and cooperation pretty highly in the political arena. And Republicans place almost no value on it whatsoever, uh, the Republican base, I should say. When they vote for somebody, they don't want somebody who will compromise and reach across the aisle. They want somebody who will punish those they see as having made America not great anymore.